On this Sunday night, Montreal's police chief uninvited. The anti-racism protests go on, but why wasn't the city's top cop allowed to come? An independent investigation is launched after a First Nations chief claims police brutality. Plus, a high-profile Republican is throwing his support behind Democrat Joe Biden. And the 10-year-old who's showing the world Canada's got talent. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Anti-racism rallies are once again taking place in Canada's second largest city. Montreal's top cop was supposed to attend, but the chief was uninvited. A group of young black activists asked that he not come because it's lost confidence in the police force. But this is a time when others are asking to repair the relationship between marginalized communities and police departments. Phil Carpenter has our top story tonight. Protesters in downtown Montreal Sunday say the memories are hard to forget. So at 13 years old, I had a police officer put a gun to my face and told me to move out of the way. Stories like that are common at this rally against police brutality and racism. No justice, no peace. One of several across the country this weekend. Sunday's event was organized in the wake of the George Floyd killing in the U.S., but is meant to highlight racism and excessive use of force by police in this country. It's not a, it's not a black problem. It's, a, it's an issue that affects all of us. Thousands gathered to hear community leaders and others express rage and to chide politicians and police for what they see as inaction on racism. Like this, we make them uncomfortable because they see what's going on. One person notably absent was Montreal Police Chief Sylvain Caron. He was asked to stay away after organizers said having him there was a bad idea. The community wasn't ready for it yet. They weren't ready because of the fact that it does, it, there, there's a bit of an animosity. Animosity that comes from years of difficult relationships between racialized groups and the police. Every encounter is something based on racism because they always come up with a bogus reason to stop it. A recent study commissioned by the city found that black, indigenous and Arab people in Montreal are far more likely to be stopped by police. Then there are police shootings. In 2016, violence erupted in the borough of Montreal North following a protest against the shooting death of Jean-Pierre Bonny and that of Freddy Villanueva eight years before that. At Sunday's rally, organizers say they hope political and police leadership start listening to racialized communities. They want this march to be the last. Aside from just coming together and marching, it's time that we create, we create change, we force change collectively. Phil Carpenter, Global News, Montreal. The Assembly of First Nations is calling on governments and police forces across the country to review their practices in the wake of a recent death. 26-year-old Chantal Moore was shot and killed Thursday after police were called to her home for a wellness check. As Ross Lord explains, her death is raising more questions about the relationship between Indigenous Canadians and police. Indigenous leaders from across Canada are demanding answers about Chantel Moore's death. The Edmonston Police Department says an officer called in to conduct a wellness check ended up shooting Moore and killing her. Edmonston Police say Moore was holding a knife, confronted the officer and made threats, an explanation her family rejects. Chantel was not violent. She was not aggressive. She was not mean. She, she was very friendly and outgoing. Maliseet First Nations in New Brunswick are calling for an independent probe of the New Brunswick justice system for what they call systemic discrimination. The Assembly of First Nations is calling for an impartial third-party investigation into why lethal force was used and whether race was a factor. National Chief Perry Belgard asks, how does a call for help turn into a call for the coroner? This should never happen. Belgard adds all governments should consider whether an armed response without proper social supports and training is ever the correct response to a wellness check. At a time when police tactics are under close scrutiny, Moore's death raises more questions about the relationship between police and people of color. I've had some clients who, uh, the police, they've called the police because they themselves are feeling unsafe, but they were met with suspicion or condescension, or they report that they uh, were met with aggression. 
A team of investigators from Quebec has been appointed to examine Moore's death. There's an online petition calling for the officer to be charged with murder. A separate fundraising campaign for family travel and funeral costs has raised well over $100,000. Organizers say any remaining proceeds will go to Moore's mother and her five-year-old daughter, Gracie. Ross Lord, Global News. An independent investigation has been launched into how RCMP handled the case involving a First Nations leader. Chief Alan Adam claims he was brutally beaten during an arrest over an expired license plate. Our David Aiken looks at whether these civilian review agencies can even affect change. It was this photo, a bruised and bloodied Chief Alan Adam, that factored into the decision to have Alberta's Civilian Police Review Agency Look at my face! I'm bleeding, man! investigate how RCMP handled Adam's March 10th arrest after RCMP found an expired license plate sticker on his truck. But this is one of the clearest cases of unnecessary police brutality. The review was welcomed as an important first step, but in some parts of the country, Saskatchewan for example, there is no civilian agency that can review complaints about police brutality and racism. The federal RCMP Civilian Review and Complaints Commission, meanwhile, is backlogged with cases, say academic researchers and parliamentarians, though the commission itself disputes that. Nonetheless, it does not have the power to issue orders or compel change. It can only provide recommendations. But Ottawa, for years, has had no shortage of calls for change. Critics say it now needs to act. That's why I'm calling for really clear policy changes to do something about it. It's not enough to just say the pretty words. Singh, for example, says police and security agencies should be prohibited from using racial profiling as a policing tool. And the criminal justice system should be revamped to try to reduce the overrepresentation of non-minorities in jail. We know that some of the mandatory minimums have disproportionately impacted those who are racialized, Indigenous people, Black people. So changing those mandatory minimums to give discretion back to judges. Academics and MPs also say Ottawa should collect more race-based data because without measuring the problem, the problem remains invisible to policymakers. We need to measure that in everything, access to business loans, access to social services. Uh, all those things will be very important and will be a gift that we'll keep on giving to improve the place of, uh, of reducing uh, anti-black racism in this country. Singh and the NDP will use their time in parliamentary proceedings next week to push the government for specific action to identify and fight racism in Canada. Robin? David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks, David. We have developing news in Minneapolis. Tonight, some members of that city's council plan to vote to disband the police force. This is the center of the crisis that has gripped America since George Floyd was killed while in police custody. Today, tens of thousands of protesters gathered once again in cities and towns across the U.S., calling for an end to police brutality. Activists say the black community is suffering on many levels, including systemic racism and higher rates of COVID-19 and unemployment. Here's Jennifer Johnson. The protests over George Floyd's death go on. Many demonstrators are calling on police departments to be defunded, not reformed, and for money to instead be poured into rebuilding black communities. <laughs> Minneapolis protesters screaming at their mayor for not agreeing to abolish the city's police force. If you're asking whether I'm for massive structural reform to revise a, struct a structurally racist system, the answer is yes. But during a rally in Minneapolis, some members of the city council said they intend to disband their police force, and they believe they have the majority of votes to do it. Take a knee! On Monday, two U.S. senators will release a new bill that includes a ban on certain police practices, which millions are demanding. This is a system that's really baked uh, that we all have to take responsibility for and get practices that just give greater transparency and greater accountability for those who are doing policing. Many black Americans are frustrated at what they see as more police brutality, higher unemployment rates than whites, and COVID-19 killing a higher percentage of their population. Experts say these demonstrations will further endanger black protesters based on new data out of Germany. There was about a two and a half times increase in the rate of transmission as a result of bringing people together in large gatherings. So we have some scientific basis to understand that these, these kinds of settings do create risk. 
Despite the risks, the protests don't stop. And now more criticism over U.S. President Donald Trump's suggestion that military soldiers should have been deployed to stop the unrest. Our military isn't trained to do this. Our military is trained for the battlefield. And this isn't a battlefield in that sense. But American politics has become a battlefield. Along with Rice, four U.S. generals have now publicly criticized the president's heavy-handed comments following Floyd's death. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. Former Secretary of State Colin Powell, a Republican, is adding his name to the growing list of high-profile political types critical of Donald Trump. The one word I have to use with respect to what he's been doing for the last several years is a word I would never have used before. I never would have used with any of the four presidents I've worked for. He lies. He lies about things. And he gets away with it because people would not hold him accountable. Powell says he didn't speak out before because he felt he had demonstrated his displeasure with Trump when he voted against him. Powell says he plans to vote for Democrat Joe Biden for president in November. President Trump was quick to respond. In a tweet, he called Powell a real stiff and Biden another stiff. There were more anti-racism protests all over the UK today. Thousands gathered outside the U.S. Embassy in London to condemn police brutality. And in Bristol, demonstrators toppled a statue of a prominent slave trader and dumped it into the harbour. The city was the centre of Britain's prosperous slave trade in the 17th century. Still to come, the pandemic has paralysed travel plans. Why climate activists are pleased. And the 10-year-old Ontario girl making music and stunning the judges. The United Nations agency that oversees air travel, the International Civil Aviation Organization, estimates global travel will see a drop of 1.2 billion travelers in 2020. And the result is the largest ever annual drop in CO2 emissions this year. As Redmond Shannon reports, even climate activists are caught off guard by the impact. When Global News first met Anna Hughes last year, she had a grand idea on climate action to get 100,000 people to promise not to fly in 2020. It's an achievable aim for just a year, but it's also, it's really hard. Cut to 2020, and instead of 100,000, millions of us are grounded. I mean, lots of people say, wow, Flight Free 2020 is going really well. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's totally mad. I mean, you look up at the sky and usually there'd be maybe five or six planes in the sky that you'd be able to count and there's none. Um, and it's quite disconcerting, actually, because this, the campaign we were running was within the context of normal and this isn't normal. This is not the version of success campaigners like Anna Hughes wanted to see. This is an action that people have been forced to take. So obviously the whole purpose of our campaign is that we want people to choose not to fly. If you choose, you feel empowered, you have other options. That's really important. Worldwide, about 25,000 people promised to stay on the ground, including some people in Canada. But one traveller who signed up to the pledge had an epic land and sea voyage cut short by the pandemic. British travel blogger Stephanie Parker only got as far as Morocco on her trip. That was months in the making. Not flying sort of re-injected this sense of adventure and excitement, which is what I love, love from travel. Um, so the Morocco section was actually the beginning of an eight-month overland adventure I had planned. The irony was Parker had to quickly fly home as countries closed their borders. Obviously at that time I felt really, really sad to have broken on the pledge that I made. Um, but it also reminded me of like... You know, sometimes we make these commitments to ourselves, but there's greater forces at work. If we choose this, and we can choose this, so uh, once lockdown is lifted, we can choose to holiday closer to home. We can choose to just um, take those, the, the positive parts of this, if there are any, and, um, you know, a apply them to our normal lives whenever they return. Flight Free plans to have a new set of goals for greener travel in 2021. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Still ahead, how do you safely protest in a pandemic? More of your COVID-19 questions answered.
watching Global National. In the fallout from George Floyd's death, tens of thousands around the world continue to rally against racism. It's a cause many are risking their health and safety for, especially in a pandemic. Today, the number of deaths caused by COVID-19 surpassed 400,000 worldwide. Now, there are concerns those large crowds gathering in close contact could spread the deadly coronavirus. Our Jeff Sample takes those concerns straight to the experts. Thousands have taken to the streets across the country, marching against racism and police brutality, and sparking questions from some viewers about protesting in a pandemic. Hi, Jeff. My name is Judy Bissell, and I'm here in Calgary, Alberta. My question is, why are people allowed to publicly gather and protest disobeying public health restrictions, possibly creating an increase in community transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Bissell worries for her mother, who lives with dementia in a long-term care home. No visitors allowed during the pandemic. So, yeah, this is a tough one, and certainly there are some contradictions here. Protest is very important, especially uh, in the country that we live in. But yes, uh, you know, when you're outside protesting, there is a risk of transmission, especially when you're in a large group. Health experts urge protesters to wear masks, keep their distance, and avoid shouting. People shouting, hollering, singing, chanting, those are the kinds of activities that from an infected person would actually uh, exp expel quite a bit of virus. Hi, my name's Elsa and I live in Yoho, New Brunswick. My question concerns a proper way to use a community mask all day long. Public health officials recommend wearing a mask and to avoid touching your face. Easier said than done. So we have this glow germ powder, which is used in contamination studies to show how germs can spread. I've put some on my hands already, assuming I touched a contaminated surface. And now I'm going to put on my mask like I would before I start the day and go out. Now fast forward and let's assume I'm about to eat my lunch. So now I need to take my mask off. And there you go. And just like that, you can see in the black light, where I've touched and potentially contaminated my face. You put the mask up like this. Dr. Suman Chakrabarti shows how it's done. And you can see that I haven't touched my mouth and nose. When you're gonna take it off, again, you do the same thing. You wash your hands, you wanna touch the loops at the back where you're not touching your face, close your eyes and mouth, lean forward, and pop it off that way. He recommends changing or washing your mask after each outing. My name is Janice, I'm from Maple Ridge, and I'm interested in knowing how well the recovered folks are doing, uh, what percentage were left with medical issues. We don't have any long-term data on persistent symptoms after recovery. But in the short term, the hardest hit patients have suffered scarring of the lungs and damage to their heart and nervous system. Around 10% of Canada's cases have been hospitalized, 2% requiring intensive care. What we do know is if people are sick enough to be in an intensive care unit, it can take a long, long time to recover. A reminder that even some who survive may never be the same. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. You may want to check the hand sanitizer you're using. Six types are being recalled by Health Canada. The products are made with industrial-grade ethanol. Health Canada says their use could lead to dry skin, irritation or cracking. Consumers are advised to stop using the products immediately. You can find the list on our website, globalnews.ca slash globalnational. Up next, look who's got talent. A Canadian girl stuns America with a golden voice. Like too many young kids, Roberta Battaglia was being bullied by some of her peers. But she may not be getting taunted any longer. That's because the 10-year-old has a gift that has stunned some of the biggest names in the entertainment world. Okay, go out there and show them what you got, okay? With the spotlight shining down, the nerves and excitement are rising up. Tell me something, boy. This young Canadian showed America and the world She's got talent. I 
was just so excited for my dream to finally come true. With a singing voice far beyond her years, Roberta Battaglia stunned the celebrity judges and more than 8 million people watched at home. But the 10-year-old from Brampton, Ontario is already a seasoned pro. She's been singing since the age of three, accompanied by her dad. My dad was, uh, he, and he still is, a musician. And, uh, you know, I used to pick up from his footsteps. And now she's hoping to follow in the footsteps of superstars like Katy Perry. Jazz legend Etta James. And one star she truly looks up to. Pink, because uh, she's just an amazing singer. Her range is unbelievable. But having a talent at a young age isn't always easy. But sometimes I do get bullied. And you know what? Let's see. Who is going to bully you after this? With the push of that golden buzzer, Battaglia jumps into the finals, and now the bullies are likely singing a much different tune. You know, all you have to do is stay strong, and you never got to uh, let yourself down. The preteen is already working on an album while continuing her schooling online. And she's hoping she'll be able to return to the AGT stage at the Dolby Theatre in Los Angeles where she hopes to wow the judges again and where she could potentially become the youngest winner in the talent show's history. Let's hope that this goes away so we could do it uh, in Hollywood. <laughs> it's a golden moment for a bright and rising star. And fingers crossed that she wins. That is Global National for this Sunday. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is the clear blue sky over Brookfield, Newfoundland and Labrador. We'd love to see your corner of this country, so send your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching. Good night.